Welcome to What Does America Mean to You? My name is Elizabeth Emery, and I am a professor of French in the Department of World Languages and Cultures. I'm acting as co-host tonight with my co-organizer, Christopher Kazmarek, Assistant Professor of Interdisciplinary Art and Program Coordinator of Visual Arts. To give you a bit of context about this evening's event, we put forward an open call in fall 2021, inviting Montclair State University students to contribute memes based on the prompt, this is my America. More than 200 members of the community, including some of you here tonight, I suspect, voted on the top 10 memes. Congratulations to our winners. Five of those finalists have joined us tonight to discuss their vision. If you're interested, you can use the QR screen here or go to the Sprague Library website for digital commons to look at a selection of the memes from this competition that we have archived at the library. They include biographies of students and a bit of explanation about why they chose the memes they did. Now, to give you a sense of this evening's events, after a few brief introductions, we'll give the floor over to our presenters here, and our five finalists will school two Montclair U State University professors about their memes and about the use of memes in general. So you can kind of imagine a dinner table here. We've got our, our food over in the corner. We have our our tablecloth laid out. And so it's around the table thinking about memes. Maybe some of you have done that. After this discussion, we will open the room to questions from the in-person and the Zoom audience. Those of you joining us via Zoom should feel free to type your questions into the chat as they occur to you. And we will moderate from the in-person and the Zoom questions. Tonight's events have been sponsored by the College of Humanities and Social Sciences, which is the largest college in the university. We combine a traditional liberal arts education with focused preparation in a wide range of disciplines and in professional areas. More than 20 majors, nearly 50 minors, and many areas of graduate study and professional certificate programs. To learn more about the College of Humanities and Social Sciences, you can check out our website and we'll post that link in the Zoom chat. To get our evening started, so welcome again to those of you just joining Zoom. It's a pleasure to introduce you to our Dean, Dr. Peter Kingstone, who has been a staunch and enthusiastic supporter of this project. We thank him for his support and we invite him to say a few words of welcome. Dr. Kingstone. And, 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 and how they see society and, and what it means mean to them. And lo and behold, Chris and Elizabeth organized something last spring about democracy. And uh, so I came to them and said, can, can we do it again? Uh, and I, so I'm very grateful to you. I'm really grateful to you folks. I'm really grateful to Pablo and, and to Nicole who are here to be the interlocutors. And thanks to all of you for being here. Always grab free food when it's available. And on that note, I'll sit down. Uh, I'm Chris, as was mentioned before. Speaking <laughs> of technology, it's what kind of makes memes possible, right? We, we've talked about this new language that Dean Kingstone discussed with his, uh, his children around the dinner table, this idea of memes and, and what it is. And, and it's, it's a to, to, to identify the first meme ever is extremely difficult because it's something that actually has been around as long as, well, probably the human condition. Uh, as, as long as you've told a joke and, and somebody else told that joke, somebody else told that joke, which hopefully has been happening for a very, very long time. But it wasn't until uh, 1976 and the book by Richard Dawkins that the term meme actually was coined. And he defined it as a self replicating chunk of information. Now, as you might imagine, in this book, The Selfish Gene, Gene this was about genetic information. But this is a term that can easily be applied to well, kind of any kind of information. And with the internet age, with technology, which as frustrating as it is, is <laughs> has allowed us to have a whole new sort of context for dialogue. 
And uh, like many words, meme is undergoing a bit of a semantic shift over time. And in this internet saturated world, it has a, a new meaning. Uh, it consists of words and images, and their meanings are, are co constructed by multiple users, multiple agents in social contexts. So these memes, these self replicating chunks of information, are, are not owned by any individual, but they're utilized by a community in order to create a context for conversation and an exchange of ideas with this new technology. So these self replicating chunks of information that grow and evolve. Uh, popular meme creator, St. Hoax, I like referencing weird <laughs> people, <laughs> defines a meme as a piece of media that is repurposed to deliver a cultural, social, or political expression, mainly through humor. Quote, it has the ability to capture insight in a way that is complete alignment with the zeitgeist. So memes are of the moment. Memes are the energy, the feeling, the truth that is found by an individual in that moment, and it's put out into the world, and then it self-replicates. And often a meme is replicating part of a visual language that has existed before, as we have this whole group of this collage of historic memes, which meme language evolves very quickly. One of the funny things with the conversation with the students earlier was we did this contest oops, five months ago now at this point, and already the subjects have changed. Uh, we look at, and already some of them have become no longer a part of the dialogue. And they exist as part of the historic language of memes. Now, some of us over 40 may not recognize these, but I'm guessing those of us under 40 recognize some, and they're, they're no longer really part of what's being part of the meme conversation. So anyway, going back to St. Hoax, memes are basically editorial cartoons for the internet age. St. Hoax has said the power of a meme lies in its, lies in its transmissibility, and unique knack for being cross-cultural. And that memes have the uncanny ability to capture a moment while distracting people from reality. They encapsulate the era we are living in, but also reminding us that it's not all that serious. So memes disrupt, subvert, and change the traditional dialogue. They are a non-hierarchical way of being able to put information into a larger cultural conversation that has become global through the internet. Uh, they are huge disruptors. <laughs> this new form of visual language is one that is far less hierarchical, as I said, and communications, blah, I'll just, memes are not hierarchical means of communication that have completely disrupted the traditional forms of political dialogue. They have allowed everyone to participate in it, which is extremely, extremely new. You used to have to be able to either have a printing press or be a reporter in order to put information into that stream. So here we have five meme creators. Let's see. There it goes. And they were given the prompt, this is my America. This is the prompt that they respond to about five months ago. Make a meme that says to people, this is my America. And these are the creators of the memes. I'll introduce them one by one with their meme. The first, Julie, interesting hobbies. Julie Guerra is majoring in jurisprudence law and society with a double major in paralegal studies and political science. She enjoys reading, ceramics, and visiting museums. She plans to work as a paralegal before going on to law school. Good person to know. Gabriella Mills is studying English and journalism and has a passion for songwriting and recording music. She enjoys learning about politics, world cultures, and social media's impact on human behavior. Published in the Montclairian, covering the Black Lives Matter movement, and online at her campus media, she enjoys service work with the Bonner Leader Organization and aspires to work in the entertainment field. That's a fun field to work in, as far as I know. <laughs> uh, Alejandro Gili is a pre-med student with a major in psychology and in the combined MBA program. He would like to go to med school and study clinical neurophysiology and discover the intricacies of the brain and the self to better understand how we know who we are and how we function. That's, that's one <laughs> Veronica Lisboff is an English major with a focus in creative writing. She enjoys art and literature. Her dream is to become a children's book author and illustrator. So joining us in the conversation today are two faculty discussants. 
They're in the middle of the round table. Uh, Dr. Nicole Archer, Assistant Professor for the Department of Art and Design. She researches contemporary art and design with an emphasis in textile and garment histories. She is currently completing a book-length manuscript which considers how textiles are used to produce and maintain the limits of legitimate versus illegitimate forms of state violence, which is a pretty scary concept to think about. Uh, her work has been published in various journals and edited collections, and she serves as editor-in-chief at Art Journal Open for the College Art Association, which is the premier higher education art association, a really prestigious journal that she is there. And Pablo Tino, last but certainly not the least, chair of the Department of Educational Foundations at Montclair State University, where he also heads the Creativity and Aesthetics Lab. Dr. Tino's work is focused on the psychology of aesthetics, creativity and the arts, arts and aesthetics in education, learning and engagement in cultural institutions, and gifted and talented education. So please join us as we listen in on their conversation about the memes they created. <laughs> My name is Gabrielle. Um, my name was the man coughing or sneezing rather into his mask and then into his arm. Um, a lot of times memes tend to focus on the negatives. If you're online a lot, especially on Twitter, um, memes can tend to be very uh, cynical. So I thought it would be important to focus on something that we all kind of do, whether subconsciously or not, to kind of protect one another. And that is my meme. Voted for yours over mine. <laughs> so, hi, my name is Veronica. My meme is uh, Is this a pigeon? So, in the original, there's a butterfly, uh, and the character is asking, Is this a pigeon? And I created it kind of poking fun at how expensive college is. Uh, I was in a chat with some friends, and some of them go, go to college or went to college internationally, and one of my friends, uh, Jen, we were talking about this whole contest, and she, they were like, this, your college is so expensive, why is it so expensive? You should make a meme about that, and I was like, you know what? Uh, so that is how this meme came into existence. So is this a way to define toward my overpriced American education? That's a really interesting one. Um, so my name is, <clears throat> sorry. My name is Alejandro, and I created a meme with, yes, Captain America trying to lift Thor's hammer. Um, so what I'm trying to convey with this meme is the need for this current generation of students and pretty much all the generations to come, that we must be a critical thinking generation, that we just don't follow the rules of like politics and um, corporations that they lead us in the way that they want us to go. Um, so I feel like in, with institutions such as Montclair State or any other college or university, we are learning how to better become critical thinkers and how to not just fall under these, um, you know, games that they want to play with us. And that's how, that's, this is a really good place to learn um, how to become a critical thinker and then lift America through a community of like educated people, not just um, under the rule of big corporation. You know, my name is Francesco, and I also did a SpongeBob meme, and why I wanted to do that was because America is at a very divided state right now, and I think something we all know, whether your generation is up here or up there, or your age, or wherever you grew up worldwide, everybody knows SpongeBob. SpongeBob is iconic. I want to deliver some humor to people, while also talking about a very serious issue in our country, and also politics, and it's just very serious in general. And I felt like that would deliver a good message while also making the stance that we all couldn't come together. We really, really tried to. Um, but as Patrick has in that um, photo over there, uh, we're not choosing to. Why are we not choosing to? I think that is a huge question. I think that's something that if we, like, smallly try and shift a lot, we can get there. But we'll see about that, I guess. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Julie. I am the second person with a SpongeBob meme <laughs> among the finalists. Like <laughs> <laughs> it's a popular show. <laughs> uh, my meme, which I titled America, so creative I know, <laughs> embodies about 10 major issues that affect our country today, 
from environmental issues to racial and ethnic um, disparities uh, to public health crises. Uh, these are all problems that everybody deals with, no matter what generation you're in. And people, especially my generation, are able to do little else uh, than kind of just roll with the punches that all these issues throw at us every single day. So I chose this specific scene in SpongeBob where there's a hyperbolic display of the character SpongeBob's brain kind of being a chaotic scene of burning mayhem. And I wanted it to relay the feeling that people, especially my generation, feel when we think about these issues. So before you were meme makers, and I'm assuming this might not even be the first meme you made, um, you were probably meme readers, watchers, viewers. Um, do you remember like when memes entered into your life, um, the impact they had on you, like how they stuck out? What were some of the first memes? <laughs> oh my gosh. I think the first meme that I saw, it was either a grumpy cat meme or I vividly recall there's the raptor from Jurassic Park meme where it's like, I can't touch my elbows. And <laughs> I remember trying very hard to touch my elbows and immediately I was like, look at this, can you touch your elbows, can you touch your elbows, can you touch your elbows with the same hand? So I think that's the first meme that I can remember having like a response to. I never tried that. You can, it's <laughs> impossible, <laughs> everyone that comes with a Velociraptor. Right. It called you into action, right. like immediately. Okay. What, what are some others that people want to know? I feel like um, along with the lines that you were saying, um, I feel like this is how it's been evolving, right? Because it went all the way from like, like a comic kind of sense of humor to something that's being more serious and taken more seriously nowadays. Because I feel like one of the first memes that I, at least I recall was something funny. I can't remember exactly what what it, what was it, but um, it was something like comic, right? And now it's going to evolve. It, it's evolving into this whole like, what are the issues of the country? What are um, what are we supposed to do? Like you know, so it's it's becoming like a form of expression. That's why it's in social media, and I think that's why it's so acclaimed because it's a way that we have now to communicate to everyone what we think and that, i think that's a that's a cool you know that, that's that's something that's evolving and it's really interesting um Andre, i agree because i'm thinking about like the first memes that i saw um it was probably on vine i remember exactly yes. not being allowed to have vine so <laughs> i would go on vine.com and like try to like look for like all the vines i wasn't supposed to like, look for um but now i feel like memes are more um like political cartoons kind of you know we're seeing a lot more memes kind of dissect um politics especially like during the last uh, presidential election um specifically like when uh president biden and now um vice president harris won there was this meme going around we did it joe and it's all you heard for like weeks and weeks um so i definitely agree that memes are now more than just uh common relief yeah, I definitely agree with what my fellow panelists said. I feel like from what I remember with memes was either when it was kind of stick figure and people were actually creating the art or we zoomed in on people's faces like at award shows. Like as you said, even with like the presidential election, um, we would see faces like, I remember there's a Tom Hanks one where he was very like surprised and people react to that and put text. And I think, I think we'll also establishing like the arts and comedy and humor why not mix that with stuff that sometimes is a little too serious? Because you want to break the ground and be able to talk about these issues, or unfortunately, you're never going to fix them. And what is our world going to become if we don't try and rally, get a rally together against the issue? So um, I think it makes sense why the art and the seriousness have been taken together, because we can all laugh, but at the same time, we can all be like, we can link to one another. And I think that's what you want when you want to work together. <laughs> um, I can definitely agree with my fellow finalists that I was chronically online, uh, even in middle school, elementary school. And the first meme I remember seeing would be the troll face meme or the doge meme, which is up there on the screen right now. And back then I would say that memes were a little bit more lighthearted or maybe I was just too young to understand the political or socioeconomic uh, undertones of them at the time. But now that I'm older and memes are a lot more intertwined with the political atmosphere or cultural controversial issues that are happening in this country today, it's turned into more of a cynical enjoyment for me, at least for me, uh, than anything. <laughs> I agree. I love that a few of you mentioned how it's become a bit of an art, because one of my favorite subgenres of meme, I guess, is when people will redraw a meme 
with like art. So the Spider-Man meme actually is not historical anymore. It came back when the Spider-Man movie uh, was released. And I remember one of my favorite versions of this meme is when people will add like a third figure in the background and people will Photoshop or draw. Recently, I saw one that had Batman drawn into it. <laughs> and so people will like mix their skills and Photoshop and like art or redraw memes. Uh, and there'll be like parodies of memes too. It's like a very intertextual type of media because this meme here with the looking back at the uh, boyfriend as he looks at another girl, I saw so many variations of that where people would find like similar panels from different movies, different cartoons, and then use that. And it just like adds levels of hilarity because if you didn't know this one, then you won't get the new one. So there's like you have to, it's almost like you have to go back and like learn all the different memes to find a new one's funny. Yeah, I definitely um I definitely understand. I definitely agree with what you're saying. I feel like memes as um the Dean has said, I feel like sometimes we don't know because we're not part of this in our generation. But at the same time, I think this is a past occurrence because as we did have propaganda in the past, this is our own form of propaganda. This is a new propaganda, how people laughed or how people related to that. Um, I think this brings a little bit more of a humor approach, but also a less, um, like we want people to laugh. You want people to laugh because sometimes the world is really too hard to um, want to process. And I think, I think this is a new form of propaganda. It just happens to be the online age we're in. So I think it is almost like you're saying the re reproduction of another thing. You know, yeah, another photo on there. I remember I saw so many photos of the guy. <coughs> different images. It's the same thing. Everything's coming back. And I think this is a new uh, age of that. So we love your memes. Um, and I think all, all five are, are great. And I, if you were to ask me to pick one, I couldn't, right? Like I could, I have certain um, comments that I can make. So I find yours, when I think about it, really gross. <laughs> just, and you know this because I wrote that question. Right? Yeah. Um, Yours is really disturbing and overwhelming. But it's, oh yeah, that's wrong. Yes, yes, all of these things are happening. Uh, so a question, I guess, is you talked about it, self-expression, self-expression, and kind of touched on things like creativity. Um, what makes a good meme, though, in your opinion? Because all five are wonderful, right? But what do you think makes for a good meme? I think I'm going to say, Humor is definitely a big part of memes. Even if memes are dealing with serious subjects, um, there has to be some kind of underlying humor. I think, um, I guess, rele relevance also. Like, for instance, your meme, Julie, is very relevant to time. Um, I think that's important in a good meme. And I think also uh, being able to understand it, regardless of kind of like who you are, or I guess, Relatability is also very important when it comes to me because they're online. And as we know, like the internet is international. It's not just an American thing, it's vast. Um, so I think having, being able to understand, you know, the meme across different genres, across different cultures makes, makes a really good meme. So I spun off of these so often. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I totally agree. I, I feel like audience is such a big part of what makes a meme funny. So I know when I was doing this, I actually used the poster uh, for this um, scholarship contest in, in the meme, because I figured it would be funny to the students at Montclair because they've seen this ad everywhere. <laughs> so like, in, like who, who's gonna understand your meme? Somebody who hasn't watched Spider-Man or Batman probably doesn't care about Spider-Man that kind of meme. Uh, but even then some of them like transcend that, like I feel like, I don't, I haven't watched Spongebob, I'm so sorry, I'm the outlier in the whole world, I haven't seen Spongebob, but I, I like your memes, both of them, yeah. and some of them will like transcend their original media and become something entirely different, and I think that's so cool. You mentioned audience, yes. what were you thinking of? Were you thinking, you, were, you weren't thinking of us, you were I'm thinking, thinking of, of Montclair students, right. because it said that Montclair movie. students were going to be able to vote, and yes. I was like, they're going to be able to vote. Every time they pay their student loans. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're getting emails from that too. So. <laughs> I was going to, yeah, um, totally along with, with what you're saying. Um, it's, I think it's about the audience mainly because um, if you follow something that you don't understand, so I'm going to Reddit. If you don't know, Reddit is like a huge platform where you can just post pretty much anything. And a lot of people just 
there's a lot of meme going on in that platform. Um, and I put like a meme, medical meme, Reddit page. So like, if, if you don't understand many of the things, like you would see in the meme, it's like, um, okay. And then that's what happens to me sometimes when I when I see some things that some memes that are from um you know current events that I might not be aware of is like I don't understand that. And then you can just do a Google search by image, and then you can understand what that's about. But I feel like audience plays a huge role into like composing a meme. And when I when I was looking at this meme and then trying to see what um what to you know how to create a meme because like the first question is like okay what are, what's your meme gonna be about. I was um, after right after our class of um, it was writing 105. So it was like about like being a critical thinker and then how can you just not just believe everything you see a paper and then just straight up believe it. No, like, well, you have to question, okay, is this <coughs> critical thinking that approach that I'm going to take to read this paper? So I knew that I wanted to do something with critical thinking. Um, and now it's like, okay, so now how are you going to make a meme out of that situation? And to be honest, I don't really know how I came up with um, Captain America lifting Thor's hammer, but um, it just like it just like came to me. It's like wait, it's like we're trying to support and then lift the country through this idea of critical thinking, so we we become like more aware and then claim our rights, right? So I just like came across like with Google images, just scrolling down, and then I saw it's like oh, and I linked like my two, you know, <laughs> my two ideas came up together, and that's how I created. It. So that was my process of creating the meme. And I think like thinking of the audience who's gonna see this, it's like everyone at Montclair State, what are we an institution that went to raise educated um, younger generation, right? So I think that was uh, my process of selecting the audience and creating the meme. I love that. And I think another thing that makes a good meme is layers. And so with your meme in particular, Alejandro, there's so many layers. I believe uh, one of the questions that we had close to us earlier was like the, the, um, the hammer moves, but also Captain America has to be worthy to move it. And so there's like all, yeah. all these extra things that if you know the media, you're like, oh, well, so now we have to be worthy in order to be able to crit critical, critically think. And what does that mean to be worthy? Is it education? Is it like how you grow up? And so it adds all these different layers. Um, it's like an onion. <laughs> That's another <laughs> meme right there. Yeah. Uh, so I like, layers to the meme and I love that yours has all these different um meanings to mm -hmm. it just because of the media that you chose mm -hmm. yeah. it helps to know the movie too it's yeah. like yeah, yeah like you said it did, he did make a move so like does that mean optimism <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like yeah we're yeah. starting right yeah so that, that was like my, my, my critique all yeah it. we're getting we're getting there through like colleges and being able to just participate into like these things I honestly didn't even think of, like, if I saw a paper, I would just straight up believe it until I took that class last semester. Because, like, you think, oh, you know, someone wrote this, like, oh, this is, like, a doctor and whatever. Oh, for, of course, that's right, right? No, like, maybe you have to kind of, like, be a critical thinker and say, maybe this is not exactly how I want to think. It's interesting you say that, right? Because um, memes are coming from a very specific place you know and they can move people in so many different directions like I I found great inspiration in your memes but sometimes I must admit I see memes that break my heart a little bit because they're supporting ideologies that I I don't necessarily support how do you, can you, you combat that you come into conversation with that what, what are your some of your um, I was actually really thinking with Alejandro you were talking you had said oh if you don't know the tv show or the movie you could just look up the photo it will make you laugh I think the one more important thing rather than audience as well you know I think that's a huge part of memes is making sure you are not reporting on or the way you're reporting is depressing or saddening because I think that's why we have come to the point of propaganda and memes is because what the media tells us is always sad it's always sad unfortunately it is always sad but I think we could also take a great insult and see the way that we um want to paint it it's not going to be positive at the same time we come to social media and we want to see it a certain way rather than the way that um we've been told to by tabloids in the world that um all these big corporate companies that control the way, particularly on the competition we're talking about, about America and the country we see. So I, even if you don't know the photo, you might actually find something you really enjoy from it. Like I don't, I haven't watched Captain America, right? That's a shame on me, but I'm saying I might see the photo and be like, oh, this is the greatest movie I've ever seen. Like, you know, so I think we want to take you away from that because we are in such a spot right now where um, nobody has answers. Is there a class on me? 
for it. I actually had for one of my classes, I'm a writing major, my digital writing class. I remember I never created a meme in my life. And um, I, I'm a Sims nerd. I like those video games of Sims. So I was like, why do I not do that? And I remember doing it. And I was just thinking, this is so ridiculous, but this is so funny that my professor, um, he let us do that. Because it literally lets you play with functions you never knew that like, just did photo editing and all. It didn't feel like school. It didn't feel like school. So um, if you ever take digital writing or ever try that, it's a great possible. I got to see, I, I think this is on our department. We should have uh, yeah, and I know, I was going to say, yeah, I, I, college, I like those. Yeah. What is there? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I took a class last semester as well. I'm a freshman, so I took everything last semester, but um, it was sociology with Dr. Zanger, and he would bring like amazing memes for like from the last century. So he would bring like, um, no, and my, my point here is like memes have been going for a very long time, um, as, it, as we introduced before. Um, so, and I didn't mean to disrespect Dr. Zanger. No, no, <laughs> sorry, I, sorry, I, sorry. I, Maybe last century because it was, they were really taken from newspapers from the last century. That's what I mean. Um, so how its sociology has evolved. Sorry, I put context into this now. Um, so, but like, it was great to see how memes have been persistent, persistently part of our society for a long time. And we used to use them in newspapers to kind of like reflect these political ideas in cartoons, right? So this is what we're doing right now. Just like it, it reaches a more audience because of the internet, right? So, so yeah, I feel like there's, there's, a, there's that part uh, in classes that we do memes um, in our college more than others. Like they also play with the relationship between text and image, right? Like, oh, yeah. So, I mean, traditionally you have this idea that like the text tells you what's going on in the image. It's like this illustrative kind of relationship. And I think one of the things that's so interesting about memes is like, that's exactly what it's trying to break down. This is not what you think it is. This is something else. And if it, a good meme kind of plays with that breakdown between text and image, right? Like, so, so that's why you might not need to know the text or the image, but if you don't know either, right. disorient them. Right. I, I, I'm like, oh, not. Yeah, I think you want to keep also like a meme open ending. Like, I think um, that's why there is such limited space, and that's why I think we use the outline of a photo. Because if you, if you put more words, sometimes more words, I hate to say this, but sometimes it's just not good. We want to keep it open minded. We want to make, as you said, critically think. Um, and if we just keep talking and talking, sometimes we're not going to be able to open everybody's mind up. And I think that's why. We um, have text numbers together in this case, so we need it limited, which would be a lot of good service for everybody. I think to kind of speak to your point about um, like how some memes are negative. Um, there's a saying, if you don't like laugh, go cry. So I find myself often on like this called like black Twitter. It's like a little like, you know. <laughs> And um, there is this like meme going around of this man. He said like horrible, like, you know, horrible things. And now you'll see it being used as to kind of like laugh at, you know, so it's kind of like taking back that power where it's like, we're no longer going to uh, be upset at this. We're just going to laugh and kind of keep it pushing kind of thing. Interesting. You're talking about ownership. Yeah. Right. Right. Yes. So here's another question. Does it, do they have to begin with the, an existing popular image? Like, have you ever created a meme or the base image you made yourself, or right, is it like I don't get that? So I feel like you do. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna be making memes after this, so, uh, uh, so we're so, taking notes. So, so a why? lot of people get really well, make like famous memes account, but I, account, but I feel like within smaller friend groups, it's it's pretty normal to use like a like a bad selfie as like a meme template. Like, I, I remember it's a bit of an inside joke, really. It's an inside joke, and like popular memes are an inside joke of the whole world. But you can have like mini memes within your friend group. I remember for one of my friends, we had a meme of of her standing up because she stood up during like the speaker at a, a conference and sit down and she stood up because she was heard it. And so for like years after we were like, sit down, sit down. And then we'd put like underneath her, a standing person, like sit down, sit down. Nobody's gonna get that except us. But it was funny and it was like a smaller group. It's really, it is an inside joke. But when it becomes more popular with like, larger pieces of media, like anime, SpongeBob, then more people understand it. But you can have like a personal meme with a, like, a group of friends. And then find the text that kind of play with that image. Mm -hmm. I would almost compare having a personal meme that you created from from nothing become super viral or super popular. Be kind of like 
hitting the social media lottery because you made your impact in what you thought would be a really small way, but then it grew to something that maybe kind of snowballed out of your control, but ultimately it's out of your hands now because other people are going to take your template if you know you're, if they if they, are, if they find that they want to, and they're going to put their own context behind it, like different people from different uh, political parties or different parts of the world even. Display a bit with like intellectual poverty. Mm -hmm. It I does. Know, I bet there's probably. Oh, there's definitely someone out there who's trying to patent a meme. Grumpy Cat did. Yes, Grumpy Cat definitely did. Yeah, a little T on the bottom photo. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, do you think there's certain types of images that should be left alone, like should not be touched in terms of memes? Like, I can imagine there are, but I'm curious what you think. Like, um, what are the limits of the types of images that people or who should be allowed to use certain types of images? Like, have you, is this something you think of? Well, I don't really believe in censoring anybody, but definitely super inappropriate images shouldn't be used in the context of memes. Like, criminally awful images definitely shouldn't. Yeah, that would break the form. Yeah. Like, okay. It would well, be funny. It would I mean, be funny. It would be funny at that point. I mean, so maybe an instance of violence, like the most recent Oscar famous Will Smith slapping Chris Rock uh, is technically a moment of violence, but it's been memed like almost to death at this point in the past, what, week and a half since it's happened. Yeah. But I feel like you wouldn't want like a body in a meme. Oh, God, no, I feel no, like no. that's, it's, that wouldn't be funny at all. But like the Chris Rock thing was so shocking that I feel like it, it was funny because it was already being publicized. It's not like something that's really private. It was already a publicized thing. So I know there was like a, a show uh, for the show Green Arrow. There was a meme of the cast members posing in front of the actor's fake grave. Correct. I would never say use an actual grave in a meme, but because it was a fake grave and the actor who played Green Arrow was largely hated by a lot of people, it was a funny meme. <laughs> but I, I would say that there's definitely limits. Like a fake grave is fine. I wouldn't use a real grave for a meme. I feel like that's a lot more serious. So I think there's limits. But as with everything, there's ways to get around those limits. And there's always going to be people who don't believe in limits. <laughs> yeah. So you just have to learn how to find what kind of memes you want and navigate the internet to create your own experience. I guess the Chris Rock Will Smith one is maybe it's okay because of Chris Rock's reaction. He kind of like just shook it off and then made jokes after. Right. Imagine if he'd gotten knocked out. Yeah, yeah. Different. <laughs> it was like, no, you can't. I feel like if so. someone had died, then it wouldn't be memeable. But right. luckily, everyone was largely unharmed. Yeah. I think it was also like a space of artistic people. What Will Smith did was absolutely wrong, but at the same time, Chris Rock also played along with it. He was a comedian, but he also humanely played along with it. I don't think he wanted anything else more than just sit out. Um, so I think it definitely depends on the people you're with. I think, as you said, nothing on the main in the main. Um, but still, at the same time, I think people will go about things the way they want if they see it funny or not. But I think everybody's goal, even if, let's say, somebody, I hate to say, posted something that you shouldn't post, I think it's about the trying to get the world to appreciate one another and what we could have and laughter. Um, I think it just really, I think, comes down to common sense. You know what's wrong, you know what's right. If I'm that telling you something you're having, you're younger. And I feel like the green light being like, no, no, don't do that. So it really depends on what you, your upper man. Like. Do you think there's like, how do you see it seems in changing so fast? I was going to say 10 years, then I feel old now. <laughs> like, that, we, you know, well, I had Sunday bunnies. I don't remember like Sunday newspaper. That's what everybody talks about. The next week it's really good. That's our meme. Um, I still write with Jonathan Pence. Like, this day. <laughs> what do you think it'll look like in uh, three, three years, five years? How will it evolve, right? I think it, yeah. I think that depends on the world. Yeah. Depends on the world we live in, who's really in the world, who's uh, where we are in the world. Um, what type of new platform we have, social media platforms, is definitely huge. Yeah, um, yeah I feel like um, as we you know, become more like tech savvy, like very to become, become, you know, more comfortable using different like video production, for example. I think that's something that we may be, we may be creating memes with videos instead of like images. Um, and regard of the content, I think that changes every single day because like as I said before, like in like a week and a half from like the last, for the Oscars, like now it's like, that's all over the media, right? 
So I feel like the content will always be changing like tremendously like um, for like so in a fast pace. Um, but regarding of like how we represent memes, before it was newspapers, now it's internet. It might be fun videos and then eventually to all of them. <laughs> yeah. You know. Um, I think we'll definitely be seeing, as you kind of said, um, intertextuality. Like, especially now with TikTok, like you'll see a TikTok video and then you'll get on Twitter and then there's references being made to that TikTok video within a day. And then it moves to Instagram, it's on somebody's story. So I think there's going to be a lot of more um, just play between, between social media apps. And I think that'll continue, especially as more social media apps are being created and used by wider audiences. I think memes can also kind of decide the fate of certain, the certain success, I don't know how to say this, the certain success rates of uh, certain uh, social media platforms. Like I remember when <coughs> Facebook changed their name to Meta and they started talking about the metaverse, I saw like probably dozens of memes just flaming, absolutely dogging the idea of there being a metaverse and us being in a virtual world and interacting with each other. And then, I don't know about if it's just me or if it's everybody else, but I haven't heard a single thing about the metaverse since. <laughs> so I think, yeah, <laughs> I think like how memes play a role in entertainment and even in the political machine, they'll definitely decide the future of certain companies. I like how you mentioned entertainment because I think there's definitely been a few like pieces of media that become popular because of a meme as opposed to the other way around. Like I know a lot of people who have never watched um, like different animes. Uh, I think right now the big one is the Pose Jojo. Jojo is Jojo Bizarre Adventure. Bizarre Adventure, that one. And I know some people who watched it just because they saw a meme and they're like, that looks crazy. That looks insane. I need to watch this show. And so I feel like memes can also I feel like now we're at a place where even like colleges are using memes to, to gain traction. And so you'll find like social media references within films. And it's always a little jarring to me when I see a character say, oh, I'm going to check my pair phone or something. <laughs> um, so I feel like with entertainment, uh, people are using memes now to, to advertise, I, especially on TikTok. I see people exactly. using meme audios. And then I'll look and it's like a sponsored ad. And I'm like, what? That's, that's interesting with this like pretty political form of speech is becoming a commercial. You're, you're, you're kind of saying it's already becoming a commercial form of speech. So the question is, in terms of its future, do we, does it get to maintain both kind of modalities or does one take over the other? Kind of, you know, this is a question of pump when I was a kid. Kind of dead. <laughs> Like, can you still be punk anymore? Or is it too commercial? It's like, can you still mean it more? I don't know. I think definitely when something becomes commercialized, it kind of takes away authenticity. Mm -hmm. Like, um, when I'm on TikTok, I don't know if you guys kind of agree. And I'm like looking at a video, I'm like, oh, this is cool. And then you see the little sponsored, uh, uh, it kind of just takes, yeah, it's weird, like that. Really it's like, oh, it feels kind of like you were betrayed. Exactly. You know, I think exactly. literally unlike the video. Like, <laughs> it's sponsored because now I know that they had money to make this funny. So it's not funny anymore. <laughs> it's like when you when you find something's being sold to you, mm -hmm. or you, you feel not betrayed, it's like it's dramatic, <laughs> but you feel like you're being like tricked into liking something because there is money backing it because person behind the screen wants you to buy this thing, it definitely does kind of take away the enjoyment mm -hmm. of memes, I feel. As a citizen, you're a consumer. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Instead of just being all together on this inside joke, mm -hmm. now I'm at a storefront and you're selling me something on my phone while I'm trying to enjoy my, my new time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think you see a, a lot of that with meme pages on Instagram, especially where a, a creator or an account user will have like maybe 12 posts in one day, and then you'll see two of those posts be ads for something that they're sponsoring. And then you'll just get, or certain users on Instagram will get so mad and say, oh, I'm unfollowing you because you just sell ads to me at this point. Like you're not original anymore. You're not a good creator because you're kind of a sellout. So <laughs> I don't know. I think it's kind of finicky. Mm -hmm. Your work with creativity. Yeah, I think this is a, the definition of creativity is yeah. making something that is novel and something that is useful. Like, and, and the the great thing about it, looking at you, and we're talking about this with with the 
all five means is it's like a combinatorial creativity, like conceptual combinations. It's really this is I guess there's there's different ways of doing that where let's say you take an old piece of in, in the olden days where you work with like classic photos or paintings, right? You take a version of that and kind of change it up. Um, but this is the difference is this is happening and within like minutes and like the sort of quick thinking. I'm not on social media, so I work a little bit slow. Like honestly, if that's a I'll admit it. Uh, I have a LinkedIn account, no Facebook, no Instagram, nothing, never open accounts there. So for me, this is just like we're talking about creativity from the work we all did. It's really amazing. And I think um, you should probably be doing research in this area. But like, do you feel as if you're doing something creative when you're actually like this process of creating these things? I think, yes. I think in order to be creative, you have to think. I think we all put thoughts into these uh, memes we did. I think we all had, for example, you know, we did, we did call this amazing, we did SpongeBob, they did, uh, we did certain TV shows. I think that all took thought. It's all different people who watch different things or have different screenshots in their heads. Because I think we all have memories, whether it's we're watching a TV as a kid or we're literally right here, right now. You're going to have a certain screenshot and certain screenshots, not your certain moments. So, if you, if you can't make a meme without some play of creativity or um, just like humor in that, or it's going to be a depressing meme, it's not going to be funny. It's, um, yeah, I'm probably talking too much. <laughs> I think for me, when I was making my meme, it was kind of thinking about universality. It was like, what is something that we're all going through right now? And at the time, still now, we're all you know going through COVID. So it's like, how can we think about that in a way that isn't the most depressing thing ever? And just trying to draw the humor out of it, trying to draw the um, the common ground out of it. It's something that we're all experiencing, that we will be experiencing for the foreseeable future. And just kind of leaning into the most, like you said, it's kind of gross, but uh, <laughs> but it's definitely a shared experience. Good jokes are gross. Exactly. Jokes are gross. Exactly. Oh, it's it's called potty humor. I don't know. <laughs> I feel like you are a community experience as well. So not just creativity, but group creativity, the collaborative, like you were kind of saying. I know like my friend Jem, they were they were part of that conversation. It was like it happened naturally within a conversation where this idea came about just the other day, uh, we moved outside for a class and the group chat for the class was flooded with people. There was a Chris Rock meme too, and they're like the rain, us getting slapped like, <laughs> um, the rain slapping us as Chris Rock or just like memes for them in the moment as well so it really is sort of like a community experience as well I feel like um, going off of what Gabby was saying um, in terms of memes not being entirely hopeless or cynical I think I at the very least and a lot of other people are on the side of certain social media platforms where memes are being created for the for a community that's definitely more invigorated by the hopeless and the cynical aspects of life. Like I remember unfortunately when the war in Ukraine broke out, there were memes about Americans, especially in our age, were getting drafted. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately that, that that's a terrible idea or a thought to even process, but I found myself laughing at certain ones because obviously women can't get drafted, but there were uh, examples of women cre mean creators saying, oh, I'm going to get pregnant to avoid the draft. And that's funny to me, at least, and it definitely was to other people. So yeah, there's definitely creators that uh, lean towards the more cheerful and hopeful, but then there are others who like to cater to the people who wallow and kind of enjoy the misery of the moment. <laughs> So do you think this is what my America, right? Like, do you think there is um I feel like something inherently American maybe about this song? I love that you said international right out the gate. So I was like, oh maybe not, but like is this like a different kind of form of democracy? Like, I don't know. I was just like, if you could think a little bit outside the question of the meme towards the question of like political participation, question of America, maybe broad kind of thought. I don't think that it's an American concept. Mm -hmm. I think it's 
it's anywhere where their government isn't censoring every single thing, but even in places where there's censorship, there are government sanctioned communities that exist. <laughs> uh, on TikTok, you find a lot of sometimes you'll get like given strange memes that feel very produced. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel like it, it's not an American thing. And to me, that that would to say that memes are American would feel very self-centered. I think I people in Australia, people in, in Europe, I feel like everywhere I feel like memes are sort of they're on the internet. The internet, anywhere that has internet, you're gonna have yeah. memes. I mean, even like some people were saying, having the newspaper, Mark Antony handing his tablet of stone to Julius Caesar. Hey, look at this. The yeah, ads of March, lol. Um, <laughs> I just feel like it's something that anywhere that you are, as long as you have access to the tools to create it, it's going to exist because it's, it's, it's easy to create in a way. Maybe not to create the best meme, but to create any kind of meme, you just have to download meme downloader 32 or something on apps, on the app store and create like a random text with yellow image like the words just easy i think it's an easy way to create a media so i, I feel like it's everywhere the opposite of that kind of, is what gabby said about universal right? mm -hmm. that's pretty interesting in terms of um just thinking about what would you thinking about the audience that's yeah what we've talked about I agree because I agree with what you were saying completely. Like a lot of times memes are memes are gonna be everywhere. Like um when I was looking at your meme, it's it's the original screen capture from like an anime, right? Exactly. So it's like, you know, memes are gonna be an international thing. And even if we don't all like get the where it's from, like for instance, you've never seen SpongeBob, I've never seen that anime, but I understand that meme. You know, right. so that's where the kind of like universality comes in. Like we can all laugh at this thing even if we don't have the background knowledge. Of what exactly it's coming from, or where it's coming from, rather. What's that app again? I use Google, like, me, 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 me. Me. yeah, I mean, I'm about to use it in class. I should. <laughs> 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 what was we're going to teach a class? Oh, we are. Really so, class. So, so, I know that you know much has it built in. Like, kind of yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, me? About the makers? Yeah. Um, well, no, I think you literally just put me maker in a Google box. I remember my professor was just like, literally just said, put that in Google and from, from there. And I think, I think it is an outlet for people too. Like, as you were saying, like, you know, if you have internet and stuff like that, and you have the tools, it could be an outlet, like for some people, you know, writing or drawing, that's their outlet. I think sometimes making humor of painful things or humor of things that we can't understand through a meme could be a beautiful thing and it could be something that helps somebody get through or you know you go on social media maybe you know a few times a day and you see one meme and you're just like that made your day that made you smile and I think it's something that is going to become more of a part as we go in and I think it's something that people are looking for with jobs why do we see so much um you need to know your social media because this is stuff that could bring people happiness you know and that, that's that's important nowadays I mean I, I think it's I think the simple style of memes is like one of the things that allows them to be popular. Like, do you, it's less intimidating than, oh, I have to reproduce a Michelangelo or something. <laughs> you know, like, the fact that, like, you know, like, I think I wonder sometimes they just wouldn't work if they were too slick, right? You have to have that kind of bad text layover, of, you know, and have a little clunky. Is that part of the invitation? The, the fact that it's not too pretty, quote unquote, or something? Yeah, it's simple to make, simple to like think of it like in the social media context, right? So you're scrolling. You don't want to be something that's too intricate that mm -hmm. people's not gonna stop and look at it. So you have to make something that's catching your eye as you're scrolling or whatever. And then oh, I like that image that, that image, and then you look at the text, oh, and then I understand the meme, and then I, I laugh or I cry or whatever the meme is about. Uh, it's also simple to create, like you can just literally just take a screenshot of whatever movie you're watching at that time and then just go to the, put it in a Google, like, word, and then just put, like, something over it. Yeah. I agree. I think that they're easy, you know, to take in. Same reason, like, I guess you're doing something, like, we put on Bob's Burgers in the background. Well, let me just put on a cartoon, because right. it's easy to look at, it's easy to take in and to digest. And I also think they're very easy to create. So it allows everybody to participate, regardless of whether or not. I have no artistic skill when it comes to drawing or anything like that. I mean, you take a screen cap and then write some words on it and it's done, you know, express that creative yeah. 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 I kind of want to build off of your question yeah, and talk please. about 
fonts. I, I was hoping, I was like, the common thing for me is that we've sort of been socialized to use specific types of fonts. Times New Roman. Times New Roman adds to the hilarity because it's the basic font. And a lot of memes will have like the subtitle font mm -hmm. at the bottom or just like a random bold white. Like it doesn't usually fit the image itself. Things that it's in the image, then it, it, you can't read it. So it's, it's very, you always have to pick something that looks out of place, which I love. I'm sticking in your thoughts. Yeah, I think with memes sometimes you don't you don't want it to look perfect. And I had that kind of thought too. Like I can remember just seeing like whoever I think my dad's on here. What was it? I, said, I took a photo of him one day. He was near the Christmas tree. He just looked like crouching. But he had like a sad face. He was like looking at the um you know MLB statistic. And I took a photo and he's like, why did you do that? And I, just, I looked at it. And I thought it was funny. And um you know if I put some like you know text over it, some typography. It, it, it's supposed to be embarrassing. It's supposed to be funny. It's supposed to make you cringe a little bit, be like, why am I laughing? Um, so I definitely agree with you 100% because if there's not that imperfection in that, it's it, it, it's not funny. It's not funny. It would have been awesome if it became big and it's your dad's. Oh, you, would have, you know what? I'd rather take the pay though for it. You know, you don't get some you know, leverage either. Um, yeah. I love that you brought it back to inside jokes. Yeah. Those are some of the funniest memes when you can share them with people who you know and you know they're not going to get things but they're funny just in the moment i know i have a photo of like my sister doing like a random gymnastics move and my mom in the background like what is she doing <laughs> and it's funny especially when you like compare it to a meme that is like a popular meme that's similar mm -hmm. and i know one of my favorite formats is when you photoshop the face of somebody that you know or a famous figure too onto a meme so like the spider-man meme um i've seen like two political figures who are arguing about something but they both agree about it <laughs> and it's like oh my gosh oh my gosh uh doing the spider-man fingers at each other uh so i feel like that's another thing when you can add your own personal touch to it or even just find a meme in the wild it's really it's just a joke like a meme is a joke it's a funny thing a lot of it's like, like a lot of the times it's just inside joke do you find yourself memeing? Now I'm going to turn into a verb. <laughs> so, you know, like in real life, like yeah. doing that, hey, me looking at you when I'm supposed you know, or whatever. Like, do you have those? Has it entered into your lives in that kind of yeah. a sense as well? Um, I live with, um, I live in a, with a host family and um, they, they're twins of 11 and they, they're just getting into this meme thing, right? And then every time they do anything, they make a meme out of it. So like they're drinking, <laughs> they're drinking water. No, actually, like yesterday, they were drinking like tea and they put a lot of sugar in it. So they were a little hype. And then he, uh, the kid said, oh, when I'm drinking water, and he goes like this. When I'm drinking like sweet tea, like, and he goes like this. So he made a meme in the moment that he was like hilarious at the dinner table. Um, so I feel like, and he's 11 and he's already making memes. So that's like an internal just like we have, right? So we're making memes out of everything nowadays. I feel like it's definitely become a part of the vocabulary yeah. that I use. There's so many words that I say, like, I remember when yeet was a big thing. All of a sudden, I was like, uh, and you yeet this out of the room. Like, I'll, you just start using it. You don't even realize. Sometimes you start using it ironically, and it just slowly slips into your vocabulary. Unironically, it becomes a problem. <laughs> but I love like kids especially will act it out. I, I know like um I've seen my little cousin has shown me these too, and a lot of times they'll like mirror it when they show it to you, and it's really adorable, but it also makes you think like why does this mean yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I can actually if I can pop in with there's a question from the audience, the Zoom audience, um, that kind of follows up on this, if it's okay for me to pop right in, yes. and it's, what impact do you think the pandemic has had on meme creation or reception? And I think that kind of follows into what you're saying. And I, and I would encourage the audience, we're, we'll begin soon the audience Q&A, so if you have questions, start thinking about them. Um, I think ever having everyone trapped at home for such long periods of time during the pandemic, during multiple quarantines, especially in different countries, um, gave a lot of opportunities for people who were working remotely and then they would have a break and then obviously they can go online and do whatever they want on their social media platforms and then they would have the opportunity to create memes. 
over what super, I guess, relevant thing was happening during that time. Like I remember during the first quarantine when there was that mass rush to just buy toilet paper <laughs> off of every shelf, of, <laughs> off of every grocery store in America. That became a huge meme. <laughs> Oh, I agree with what um, Julie was saying. Oh, I remember like the first quarantine. That's when TikTok was still kind of a joke. Like if you had it, you were like, why do you have that? Like that's a kid's app kind of thing. And like my, I, me personally, I would just spend hours a day on TikTok, making TikToks, et cetera. And I feel like that kind of informs where we are now. Yeah. Now, everybody, like not everybody, but now millions of people have that app. <laughs> And similarly, I also feel like it kind of informed the content of memes now. It's like there's a lot of memes about, um, again, with the quarantine, when um, people were like singing out their balconies in Italy mm-hmm. oh, or something. And it was beautiful. Yeah. And then people started putting like Katy Perry songs over it or like NWA songs yeah. over it. It's like, you know, this is not what's being sung in Italy <laughs> at, at like Japan. Um, so I do think the pandemic has even brought us a little bit um, closer in terms of memes. Definitely. Because now, like, like some memes are an inside joke. Now we all have this huge inside joke. Yeah. And also during the pandemic, it was kind of one of the only ways that you could communicate with people. Mm-hmm. I know there were definitely a lot of friends who I used to see every day in class. And then all of a sudden, I wasn't seeing them at all. And for a long time, I could probably go through our text messages and it would just be like every month a picture, a <laughs> meme, a different meme, a different meme. Like every every month, every few months, and that's like the only way. And then they just react like "lol," ha ha ha, laughing face or a sobbing face or something. That's really the only way that we had. I feel like for a long time, TikTok definitely owes most of its success to the pandemic. Mm-hmm. I would definitely agree with that. It's the kids out thing. <laughs> totally agree. I was like, oh, there's like, children on there. Why would I? Why? Right. Are there? But then all of a sudden, everyone was there. So it gave you something to hold in common in a moment where you couldn't. Together, yeah, yeah, to definitely. Your, your point, Veronica. I think it's also like people will say, like, oh, well, why didn't you talk, or why didn't you go on the phone, why didn't you text? And I think when you're in a difficult, the pandemic was difficult. I don't think anybody knew how to talk about it, nobody knew it was gonna happen. And I think sometimes by the simpleness of just sending a photo with a few words that could bring that joy in that dark moment. So I think it's like if you you have a social media advice, but it's like that is one thing that could actually bring people joy rather than because you don't know what's gonna happen, you don't want to say something so late, false, be like. It's gonna get better, but then the world explodes like that's the last few days, not in the last years. Um, so I definitely understand that. Definitely. Um, to relate to that, I think what we were able to connect with uh, in regards to each other was severely limited. Like Veronica said, I went from seeing my friends every day to almost never, especially when before the time of vaccines and boosters. And the only time I was ever really able to laugh or connect with my friends over a certain topic or something that brought us joy, it was a meme. It was a, a meme about a current event, like the, the toilet paper frenzy or uh, the Black Lives Matter uh, movement and all the riots that were happening in, in June of, uh, uh, what was it, 2020? Yeah. 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 Do we, is that, so we're, are, is this the time? I feel like- Yeah, so I was gonna say if the panelists have any like questions. burning questions to ask, mm-hmm. because then we will turn it over to the audience and the Zoom audience. Mm-hmm. I thought we were already doing that. <laughs> we're kind of sort of, <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah, a yeah, conference, dinner table. Yeah. 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 Right. Now the hard questions. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Well, there is another yeah. one from Zoom. Uh-huh. Shall I, maybe I'll, I'll speak into the microphone because I think some of the people at home are having a little trouble hearing. Oh, okay. So this is from um, Dr. Timoni, who asks, how implicitly or explicitly did what constitutes America figure into your process? So how much did you think about America? And so historically, what America might mean to some people, but not others, like indigenous peoples, or... Um, a little, you know, maybe going back to your discussion of the international, right? Who people who are in the U.S. in the continental U.S. but non-U.S. territories, um, and then there's sort of a second part to that. So I'll just throw it all out, and you can you can pick through it. Is how do you think maybe cartoons or versus images of real people, even if they're manipulated, play into power of a meme? Right. So you touched on that a little bit already. Um, 
And then maybe an example of a mean, how a mean uh, pushed people into action or was responsible for a result that could go back to the mean. I think that's actually probably three separate questions now that I'm using. Sorry about that. Maybe I can go back if you want to pick out one piece. So the first one, I, I was talking with uh, international friends and I, I just told them how much I paid. And there was a lot of shock, like dot, dot, dot. Everyone was typing. It was like multiple people are typing in the chat. And I was like, oh no. So I feel like when I was having that conversation, I was already like the American person. So I feel like that's how America factored into my meeting was the other people in the chat who were American were like, yep, that's how it is. <laughs> it's it's like that, fresh out of high school, here you go, have some debt, right on a platter. Uh, so I feel like, I mean, for my meeting, it was because of the context of the people that I was having a conversation with. Oh, I'm gonna, okay. So I'm from Spain. I'm an international student myself. And there, pretty much, if you've done decently in high school, you, you pass your stuff, you pretty much get like almost like your education paid from the government, right? So you basically, my, my sister just graduated there and she paid like, like 500, 600 every semester. So it's not much. But I will say the, the fact that students straight out of high school, have to figure out how to apply for a loan, how to file FAFSA, how to do this, how to do that. I, I would disagree that's a negative part of America, and that's one of the reasons why I like studying here. Um, all my friends in Spain, they're like stressed out with university, like, um, and I feel like I myself, I feel myself more relaxed in terms of like I I'm paying for tuition, so I'm I'm gonna take the, the most I can I can get from the from the institution, right? I feel like you look at the different perspective, right? So and I have like the both words here, like pretty much one, it's pretty much free, and then I'm here paying. And I'm leaning towards like me paying because it's making me more responsible of what I'm learning, making sure that I'm taking, you know, everything I can. So I feel like sometimes having that it just grows you as a better person. So I'm not saying that, I think it's a little wild and expensive here, but like that's how it is. Um, but then also like we shouldn't look at the opposite side, like it's pretty much free because then you don't appreciate what you're learning. So most of my friends, they just graduated. Um, I'm 24, so my friends already graduated. And then they, they think like, um, it's, like, it's like a high school version 2.0 and that's not what's supposed to be like university. So I feel like you just have to find the balance. So maybe other countries have like, a better balance with like part of the government, part of yourself. Just file, just learn how to do all these stuff, but then, um, yeah, that's for the first part of the question. Now, how this relates to internationality and indigenous community, that's a really interesting question because like, as we said before, audience counts a lot. So this meme applies to everyone, right? So the meme that I created, um, because like it's a, it's a, it's a, America is like a big country, right? So it has an influence all over the world. So everyone can relate that pretty much understand. Um, and for example, for indigenous communities, this will have a great impact. So for example, here at Montpelier State, we have a really good like indigenous program. Um, so if we are raising people being aware and critical thinking and through education, we tell them, hey, there's these indigenous communities that they exist, um, we can lift America in a better way, right? So um, I feel like you also have to be careful with uh, what you put in the meme, because as we said before, there might be not such a, let's call it like positive views that we want to take a meme from. My, my point with this is like, you might have like some people that they're the opposite way of the spectrum where they discriminate, right? So they might create a meme that goes against the indigenous community. So um, I feel like it depends on who your audience is targeted for. That's how you're gonna have like a meme reception from it. But um, I don't know if I'm making myself clear. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah. it depends on the audience and how it's going to have an effect. Okay, anyone else? Like, this, did this mean contest give you an opportunity to, like, were you already thinking critically about, you know, what America means, um, you know, regardless of whether or not you are an American? Um, but uh, what did this give you an occasion to start to think about that? You can still call I think that's a good question. Can I speak to the second question where we're asking, you know, whether a meme is up? Oh, I guess live action versus cartoon. Mm -hmm. We're kind of talking about um, how memes can be international. 
Like when we export movies in the US or when movies are imported here, we don't change the images and change the words. Mm-hmm. So I feel like that kind of speaks to memes as a whole. The images don't necessarily, the images are what comes across as universal. Mm-hmm. And then we just change it so that we all have a better understanding right, of what we need to try to convey. Right. <laughs> Yeah, and I apologize, that was three separate questions. Thank you. Yes, Dean, please start. What's your time? Call me Peter. Peter, all right. You folks do. Call me Peter. First of all, I should say, I'm really enjoying it. You folks are incredible. I mean, honestly, you're so thoughtful and reflective and articulate. Um, and I, you know, I've confessed to you that, that this is a very, very strange landscape for me. And I'll, I'll illustrate it for you, Veronica. I'm glad you used the word geek. My, my conversation with my daughter and her best friend began because they were trying to explain, I'll eat this to me. <laughs> and it, it literally took a half an hour. I still don't understand it. But later on, I used it with my son. I referred to him and he, he fell out of his chair laughing. <laughs> and I said, what did he say? like a monkey speaking English. <laughs> there, there are so many things that you said that I found I found really intriguing and are so so different. I don't know if other people in the room you know feel the same. I, I, so much of what you said is, is so different to, to me and to my mode of communication. But I, I wanted to ask something that really struck me for all of you. And, and, and um, you know, a, a number of you have talked in different ways about the importance of memes uh, and humor as a way of essentially uh, forming community and coping with dark things. And uh, my generation, the message was always, if you want action, if you want change, you need to outrage. You need to make people angry. And a lot of what you're talking about is, is we are angry, but we're finding ways to actually cope with it and make it smaller and manageable. And I'm wondering, do, is, do memes have any impact on you uh, in terms of action, mobilizing? Uh, again, because for my generation, your approach to it is exactly what we were told was actually what ends action. I feel like it's difficult because we're at a place where a lot of times it feels like there's not a lot of action that we can take at this point. Uh, there's a lot of rhetoric where it's like, what's, what's the point? Like, what can you even do about this? So I feel like, do memes have an impact? I think to an extent, they create curiosity. So for me, sometimes I'll see a meme about a political event, and that will encourage me to go research that event or to learn more about this uh, niche concept or something. So I don't know that memes necessarily are like the call to arms that people are looking for, but I think that the world is changing and outrage doesn't always appear physically and everything's so on the internet right now that I feel like when you see a flood of memes about something, that's the outrage, that it's creating awareness in that situation. It's educating more people or encouraging people to educate themselves more than anything else. Yeah, and thoughts eventually would lead to action, right? So hope that's I think that's it's a great way of like spreading what's going on. Um, you might have not thought of something that you didn't see the meme. Then you see the meme, you start researching, and then maybe you can take part of whatever movement is being created. Um, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> um, I think there definitely is time for action. I think our generation is open to action, and specifically like. In 2020, Black Lives Matter, and even continuing like now, um, I still kind of keep up with it and follow. There's lots of different rallies and protests going on specifically in Newark, my hometown of Patterson. Um, but I also do think, kind of like Veronica was saying, there is a lot happening online as well. I know, like, there's this thing called CARD, C A R R D, where it shares just a ton of information about any uh, social justice thing you can kind of think of. So I think a lot of activism has moved. Um, online because a lot of the people that are interested in activism now are young or they are living with their parents or they are under 18 and their parents may not agree with what they feel. So they, they move their activism online to a space where they can make impact without having to physically uh, put themselves in danger or physically go against their parents. Et so I just think that there are more streams of activism that, than there have been in the past. Um, and I think memes are kind of a part of that. Maybe not a big part, mm-hmm. but I do think they contribute to kind of like Alejandro was saying, how thoughts do become action. 
you know, I think memes make a great space. And I think like you were saying how in, you know, back then when it was just about outraging people, I think that could have worked then. That might have maybe been the great space, but it also may have elevated why at times we see so much violence and we see so many horrific events because that's what we were taught. And I think sometimes, you know, if something's not broke, you don't have to fix it. But I think there's a time where we all acknowledge we have to grow as humans. And I think memes happen to be, even in the little niche, that great space that we could all uh, come together and understand each other, or at least try to understand each other. So I think um, I think there's always room for growing. And I think this could help grow people as, a, you know, maybe it wouldn't sound appropriate now, but as you were saying, maybe that was the way to get people going. This might be a way to get people going rather than have two sides, like just put your arm out and be like, oh, you know, if you like it, you like it. And if you don't, you don't. And I'm expecting to call it. I think there are too many variables to depend on when it comes to memes inciting people to be more active when it comes to uh, terrible issues that are happening in America today. Um, I remember in, during the summer of last year, there was a flyer going around uh, across a lot of social media platforms about a uh, strike during one day in October, it might have been October 15th, about everyone in America taking one day off work. And I remember thinking, wow, this is such a great idea for, like, I guess, for people to show to corporations or just their small business employers. Like, you know, we want these benefits. We want these uh, improved employee rights. And we're going to show this through this one day where we don't go to work, where we strike. But then that, that movement or that cause kind of died in the wind because there wasn't enough traction, the memes weren't successful, and there was, no, uh, commu- there was no media coverage of it. So I think memes can take you far, but it can only take you so far. Yeah, that's the big corporate part. It's like, is the media that we all in tune to could actually take the perspective of the people? No, I think we've seen that, especially going into the last five years. We're getting told no, no, no. Like, I think the way you said it, I was even thinking mentally as well. Like, people are hurt mentally, and that's why we'll sometimes go to the internet. Like, you hear about the four day work, what we, we all think about it as a thing, but if there's enough traction and we get rid of all the big corporations and we actually put the people there, like we're doing with this, we would maybe get there. You know, so I think I think memes could also be a big thing for mental health as well. And what we want is people, not what they tell us they want, you know. I know my answers went like, <laughs> yeah. I was just like it's in the moment. <laughs> also, okay. No, I wonder if um in fact what you were saying, if you try to pose an Instagram, for example, something that goes against um meta. I was gonna say meta Facebook, I don't know how they call it now, but like if you try to post something against them, they're not gonna take it down because they say, Oh, that's against it. they 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 um, your freedom of speech. But they will they will add the uh, algorithm so it doesn't get mm-hmm. as much audience mm-hmm. as it would. So I wonder if like if, if taking up like they have work, did big corporations and big um, companies did something for the algorithm so that doesn't show up in so many people's feed pages. Um, so they have sort of control of what's going on. That's, That's like, also yeah. I definitely agree with you. I think it's, it's taking away people's freedom to express, like just because you might have the right side of things that the media, you know, says on their, you know, when you read the, nobody reads it. The whole thing where you're like user agreement, and it's like twelve thousand pages, <laughs> it's in there, and then they take it off. And I think Alejandro definitely. I, I know I interrupted you. I'm sorry, but it definitely they're taking away your freedom right there because, like, you know, and we'll, well, they're 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 purposely telling you we don't want this on here. And it's not like it's something that's inhumane or anything. It's just an opinion, and that's what we are in America. Why can we not hear other people's opinions? Oh. I feel like, oh, sorry. Either of you. Say, Professor, <laughs> did you have a question? Yeah, I mean. Yeah, Veronica, <laughs> I feel like there's a positive side to that, too. I know I've seen on TikTok specifically uh, for Black History Month or Asian American Awareness Month, where there will be days where creators, large creators, will agree uh, this is not my day. I'm not posting. And then you'll get this beautiful flood of like different people, different cultures who are finally being represented because other people forcibly removed themselves from the wow. algorithm. Uh, so I, I, I see like a little bit of hope or there's still people out there who are willing to take it into their own hands and make that action. Um, but you have to look for it. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. <laughs> and it kind of goes into this idea of freedom and creation and corporations. And, and, and earlier we kind of uh, talked about, oh, we saw a sponsored one. And we're like, eh. or it's, it's a little too produced. You know, it didn't feel authentic. And, and, and this idea that, 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 uh, that I started with, with it's a non-hierarchical field where basically anybody can make one of these. But once you have a creator that's being compensated, we feel a little sideways about it. And, and this, this kind of runs two ways here, because one, being a content creator, should we be compensated, right? We're creating the content for these platforms. So we're, 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 we're starting to play with these corporations where we just talked about their algorithms and blah, 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 but we're playing on these platforms and we're creating the content for them that brings the eyeballs to their platforms. So there's something awkward happening there. And, and, and what is it about memes where we're comfortable creating this content for free on platforms? And in fact, we actually are, are uncomfortable when someone is compensated for creating this content. What is it about this form of visual communication that, that has this relationship between creators and consumers? Um, I definitely think content creators should be paid for the content they're putting out, um, especially if it's quality. Um, but I, so for instance, I'm on TikTok. I have like a, a, a nice little following, and I tried to get into the creator fund, and I did. But what TikTok will do is they'll, just like shadow ban is the word for it. They'll purposely put your videos with less views, or they'll not push it to other people's pages because they don't want to pay you. Uh -huh. So I do think it's terrible. <laughs> it's, it was so frustrating. <laughs> Um, so I do think that brand deals and things like that are, they, there is a place for them, but I think just honesty is what's important. So when a creator says like, Hey guys, it's an app for, and the video will continue. I think that's perfect because you don't feel like you're being duped. Mm -hmm. But, um, but as we were saying before, like when there's this whole, I guess, production, and then you see like this tiny little thing that says ad sponsored, it's like, oh, you know, like, I, they got me again, kind of feeling. Um, but all in all, I do think content creators should be paid. Yeah, that's I agree. Right. Content creators should be paid. And to your point, when I was talking about sponsorships, uh, I'm not talking about content creators that are like people still. So if I see like one of my favorite cosplayers or an account that I that does like video essays and they have an ad, I will watch the ad. I will click the ad so that they get their money. But if I see that Walmart has put a person and pretended that they're just a normal person and they're an employee actually when i see like a, like a, a larger corporation pretend to be a single person that i hate and those are the ones that i will like but if i see someone like i'm trying to think of a content creator they've all left right my mind sure if i see <laughs> a creator, or if i see um a mallory which is like a, a cosplay account she does a lot of um, superhero stuff. If I see that that person has put out an, an ad, I'll watch it. But if, again, if I see like the sponsor, it's different. If it's a creator and it's an ad that they're doing, they hashtag ad. Mm -hmm. If it's a if it's a corporation, there's a little gray sponsor sponsored um, like floating in, in, the, corner. Corner. <laughs> you, like, video in the corner, and, and that I hate. That I won't watch. I'll scroll. I'll say not interested. Get off my page. But if it's just a creator. They're trying to pay for college. I'm trying to pay for college. We're all trying to pay for college. So those I'll watch. So I, I think it comes down to who is putting it out there. If it's a company paying a single person, I'm fine with it. If it's a company pretending to be a single person, then it's lying to me. Um, I definitely agree with Veronica. And I think that all kind of fall, falls under the umbrella of transparency from the creator who's being sponsored. Um, for example, when... I follow this uh, account on TikTok where this guy will take his boogie in his backpack all over New York City and he just like interacts with the people on the subway or in parks and it's very wholesome and it's something that you know a lot of people could get behind like no one's gonna see this corgi this adorable dog and be like oh hate this dog <laughs> <laughs> and this uh this content creator while he's doing all this will sponsor uh the backpack that he uses specifically to carry his dog around and he tells you that he donates the funds that he gets from his content creation to uh, animal shelters 
for animal rights activist groups. And I see that and I'm like, okay, I, I'll see his ad and I'll understand that if I like this, I'm giving him money and he'll be sending that money to these organizations that I have no problem receiving that money. But uh, during the month of June, if I see Walmart or Nike or Chick-fil-A have a rainbow flag or uh, promote a product that is definitely geared toward the LGBT plus community or even Target, I'll have this slimy feeling where I know that if I put my money towards these products or this corporation, I definitely know my money is not going to support that community that they are claiming to uh, celebrate for that month. It, to clarify a little bit, I wasn't necessarily just talking about content overall, like, you know, Backpack Corgi guy, great stuff, but you wouldn't necessarily call his content meme format, right? So I was looking at the meme format specifically as this space where anybody can, can sort of have the same bad aesthetic, because that is part of the aesthetic, having the incongruent text and all of that kind of thing. Uh, and, and how even in this meme space, it seems like we might be creating a hierarchy where like a sponsored meme is different from a non-sponsored meme, a sort of authentic meme. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? <laughs> Memes are bad at making memes and they're not usually funny. They'll be like, oh, be the Snickers. And you're like, like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's like a monkey trying to speak well, I think the underlying like, question is, are all memes that are okay, all memes? I mean, like, I mean, this is the, a question a lot of people ask themselves, which are we all content producers for Facebook, essentially? Like, mm -hmm. like to what extent? I mean, yes, you can entertain the idea that you're doing some form of consumer activism by clicking or not clicking, but, you know, meme started on a very different kind of platform, and now they're on a pretty commercialized platform, right? So can, will it survive the commercialized platform? Can you part of the press for this thing that started on, like, a Reddit kind of um, platform or whatnot? That's a I, yeah, big question. We have one more hand. I'm so sorry. Like yes, question. yes. And this oh. may have to be the last question because okay. we've gone beyond time, but it's oh. so fascinating. You oh. really oh. are turning a circle from you know, family dinner table to solving the problems of the world and denouncing <laughs> the problems. It's really oh. fantastic. Please. Yeah, I want to, um, I'm assuming I'm from the College of Ed, College of Education and Human Services. The, um, so I'm hearing about um, the ways in which memes are used to communicate ideas and how that the idea of communication really you know, amplifies as, as that meme is shared. And I'm wondering how, um, how you see this as a way in which, as a form of literacy, and, I, and I'm drawing upon some work of my, my colleagues, Michelle Noble yesterday, but, and her husband, Colin Langshire. They wrote, wrote, write about um, new literacies and memes really being part of this, you know, this, this, this approach to communication and education. Because it's not only the visual, which transcends cultures and, and languages, it's also the comments or the ways in which that's, you know, that there's a thread of communication that follows that as well. And so I'm wondering how you see this as just another, how, how this is used as a, a way to develop literacy and, and the ways that you might see this used in college classes to, to communicate and, and, and develop that literacy. Well, I have a professor, um, Dr. Marley, you want to make it? And he actually uses memes to explain his lessons in class. And I think that's the most fascinating way because I remember everything, you know, it, it's such a good way to learn and stuff because it's, it, it's fun, it's educational. So um, he's trying, uh, he explains like uh, psychological research which means like, oh, what does it mean? And so I think it's a great way to kind of like, um, as he's saying, research new ways of literacy, right? Um, so definitely it's, it, it's going to evolve because it's evolving already and it's constantly evolving and will evolve. Um, so totally agree with, um, and back to the question, well, not back, but like related to the question of like, oh, will survive a commercial thing? Um, it will survive and, and it will transform from a commercial to educational to advertising. So I feel like it, it's become such part of our society and culture that it's like a, it's like a plant, right? <laughs> it's going to be everywhere. No, I, 
I mean, I definitely agree. And I think it's something like uh, you said with your class, like with my um, digital writing class, Professor Henry Marnicue, I, I feel like I'm messing up the last name, um, but exactly the same thing. He would start with a meme or he remember one day he challenged us, and this is a little bit off the meme part, where we had to write just using emojis. And I think that way of, like almost like charades, that way of thinking outside the box and be able to communicate beyond our words can actually do a lot more sometimes than like the words we use. And I think um, we could draw images without actually having, I think it's a new form of communication. I think it will evolve and almost our words are more illustrative than we actually think they are. Yeah, I feel like as far as education, images are almost always a lot easier to remember okay. than like a block of text. So I feel like it's easier to retain information when it's like, it's sort of like how they tell you to make a PowerPoint, but nobody actually does it. Everyone actually does a <laughs> paragraph points. But the way that you're supposed to do a PowerPoint is key points. And I feel like memes are a really great way to create an image that has a key point because you want to use a minimal amount of text because it's going on, a, on an image and it's usually it's a small thing on someone's phone. So I feel like by doing that, it, it does allow people to, to retain that information. I know some of the, this might be a little, I am an English major, but Shakespeare is hard. So <laughs> learning Shakespeare by going through like Hamlet memes can be one of the easier ways to understand just the satire and like all the sarcasm that Shakespeare puts into the play that you don't really understand when you like are, are initially reading it because it's not being performed. So when you combine it with like, say an image and you have Hamlet and, um, like a different character doing the Spider-Man guns at each other, all of a sudden you're like, oh, I get it. So I feel like it, it can be used that way to help people understand because it's so simplified. It's like an overly simplified version of whatever is going on. Like this about education, education is such a huge topic. I can't possibly contain it all in one meme, but this is like a point, a single point. So it's easier to digest. So I feel like as far as literacy goes, it can be, it can help people, and especially I think younger and a younger audience to be able to digest information in a way that they'll be able to retain it and remember it and apply it. That's actually probably the, the perfect concluding point for our <laughs> educational institution and mission. And I, I really, I hope that you will all just join in a huge round of applause. For this. The big questions and the, the chats and bearing with the, uh, the, the microphones, it's really been wonderful for all of you. And really warm thanks to um, Dean Kingstone, Jackie Novak, Joanne Caruso, Karen Ramston, and then the, the, the Dean's colleagues, Courtney Cunningham, um, Jessica Brennan, and Leslie Wilson, who then helped with all the food. So I invite you to continue. Ask all your questions about, so what is that again? <laughs> Please tell me finally what all you eat that means. It's a crow. It's a crow. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you very much. So please just ask informal questions and thank you to the, the, the crowded Zoom crowded home.